So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Damian Jovanovic. <laughs> <Yes, what? laughs> <laughs> um, he's a professor at SciArc and he has a design studio that is called lifeforms.org. Uh, that I oh, sorry. Like Amazon is called not called Amazon, it's called Amazon.com. It's the same thing with this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're really excited that you're here. Oh, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. This is great. I'm excited. Um, and thank you for the invitation. And it's really fantastic to be in Orlando. When I was a kid, in, I'm from Serbia, you know, and in Serbia, basketball is a big sport. We, you know, and what my favorite team was Orlando Magic, and I was, I never thought that I would come to Orlando, so I'm super, <laughs> I'm really excited to be in Orlando. Orlando is awesome, so thank you for having me here. Celtics or Warriors? Sorry? Celtics or Warriors? Celtics. Celtics. Huh? Celtics? Sorry. <laughs> They're green. I like green. <laughs> I have a lot of green projects, you know, nature and stuff, we'll see. Um, so I'll talk today about this, um, <laughs> this topic, games and world making. And this is <clears throat> world making is kind of a thing that I'm working on in the past few years. It's my attempt to kind of maybe think of a new way of, uh, uh, you know, thinking about representation and, and uh, aesthetics and modeling in architecture. And, and you know, it's, it's called world making. So to kind of distinguish itself from, from world building, which is a more commercial idea, right? So, you know, world building is something you might do for a game or for a movie. It's, you know, commercially oriented, but world making is something that is maybe coming from history of philosophy. Uh, Nelson Goodman speaks about ways of world making and different, uh, how, we make, how we make worlds from different pieces of other worlds and how we kind of recompose existing realities to produce a new kind of expression. So. I'm very much interested in these things. And you'll see the projects, I'm gonna show a lot of different things and they kind of present more kind of a search for, for this idea rather than a, kind of a definite expression or a solution or something. So I primarily work with simulations, which as we learned from Ricola just before, belongs to the left side. Of, uh, <laughs> But in, in, my, in, my, in my kind of research, simulations are these kind of, or let's say, a new artistic design formats that can be um, kind of, that are distinguished from previous, let's say, formats that architecture was dependent on, such as drawing or animation. And I'll talk about that as, as we go. But, you know, something like this, this is a web simulation that you can go and, and play uh, online. It's basically a kind of an interactive model, right? And um, it's it's interactive, right? That's one of the main points of, of kind of having this idea. So basically, there are four agents, which are symbolic AI, obviously, that kind of behavior tree uh, reflex agents, and they are living their life in you as a designer kind of intervening in their reality. You know, you are outside of this world, looking in and kind of making the space for them as they are kind of going about their um, personal experience. And you have all these tools like sections and, and things like this. And, but I mean, one of the parts of this idea is really to, um, to kind of think about alternative ways that maybe architectural software or architectural design practices are, um, as, as we've seen also today, they're dependent on these procedures of measuring, of, pre of precision, of different kinds of ideas of, uh, let's say, measurability or, or, you know, kind of legibility. And I, I'm very much interested in kind of disrupting that space a little bit and working with play uh, as kind of a fundamental condition where play also brings uh, or, let's say, opens up the space to, to kind of randomness and chance operations and uh, lack of control maybe, yeah? Maybe kind of going away from this extreme um, kind of heritage of precision that architectural design is, is kind of op always operating in. And you know, when it comes to aesthetics, I'm, I'm interested in kind of exploring different ideas. What is, what is what, one of the major points of this work was, can we make an interactive real-time simulation that collapses realism and abstraction understood as 
as like aesthetic expressions, right? In, in one kind of visual space, let's say. That was, that was like the main, kind of the main idea in the project. And obviously the other idea was to kind of explore um, physics-based interactions and randomness and things like this. Um, so simulations are different than animations because they are kind of unpredictable, open-ended. They are, you know, they are difficult to read, difficult to maybe uh, understand as narratives, as stories. Uh, they're difficult to maybe uh, access immediately because they don't really have a story, right? They have a kind of a, uh, they're happening. They're just there. And I think this is interesting because it opens up maybe new ways that we can think about what constitutes um, you know, authorship, audience, the work of art or the work of design, many of these different things that we spoke about today, I think they kind of, they come and they uh, play, you know, in this, in this format, basically. So for example, here, one of the, one of the works is, is uh, you have these two agents that are inhabiting a small kind of toy world. Um, what, what is interesting here is that before you know it, you will start constructing a, a narrative around these two agents, right? Even though you're looking at two uh, <laughs> something, two clumps, yeah? Uh, you will start maybe imagining or kind of reading into, or let's say granting minds to these agents, and you will start imagining what is happening inside this um, simulation. So this is maybe one, one, one of the main ideas when it comes to psychology, that, that I'm going to talk about later as, as we go. So rendering is a big topic, obviously, with, with simulation. As, as you've seen from the previous presentation, you know, just cause and these big games, they are interested in realism, interested in, in kind of producing a coherent, predictable, beautiful image of the of kind of the world. Um, and I think simulations can, they, as an artistic kind of uh, work, they can kind of expand on that, you know, they can test different uh, other expressions, they even mix between kind of expressions which maybe don't fit together really well. Um, and then, but um, yeah, what, that's another maybe point that I'll be touching uh, upon later on. So software, I think, if we, if we don't think about it as a purely automated process, Right? If you think about it as a process of where the, a human has to interact with the image of the world or a picture or, or some kind of a world picture, th this is where it becomes interesting to think about software as a collapse of production, pre-production and play. Um, many of you might know that contemporary game engines can you know, render high resolution images at 60 frames per second uh, of immense complexity and uh, maybe one of the uh, one of the things that I'm working on in, in my work, but also with students, as you'll see now in, in this, this is from just now, um, from the last semester at Sark, we did a project where uh, we made a tool for kind of, maybe this is not playing actually. Yeah, you'll see it now. It's, it's a tool that, uh, whose, the, the main point of this tool was to kind of, um, why is it so choppy here? I don't get it. It's a Sorry? Oh, that's it's not good. That's not good. No. <laughs> Look, good. this is perfect. It's running perfect. I'm, I'm very sorry to actually see this. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, what I want to say about this is that we are kind of experimenting with format where you don't have to make drawings anymore or you don't have to make animations anymore, right? You kind of make this simulation and everything is integrated within this one world, one project. You get, you make a screenshot, you get a drawing, you make a recording of your screen, that's how you get an animation. But it's real time and it's um, kind of, it's real time on my screen, here is not real time. <laughs> you, know, you can imagine it being real time. I can show that. Yeah, please. I want them to see the full, <laughs> <laughs> Very relaxing, yes. So, you see, this is the problem with simulations. No one knows how to show them properly. Please, please clean the <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> Great. Um, anyway, the, the idea is like, it, what if you don't, what if as an architect, you don't make separate plan section model animation? What if everything was in one design space? That's kind of the idea, right? So, so in many ways, this is uh, the, the attempt to kind of answer that question. And uh, since we're working with this way, we can then output a, a, a large amount of things from the model itself, right? It becomes kind of the working um, tool, but at the same time, it's, an, it's a picture, it's a representation that is finished. There is no post-production, right? There is no kind of Photoshopping, there is no uh, after effects, right? So this is very much uh, the idea here. So I'm going to show you this project, which I showed, I think, at, at Zurich, when I was at, in Zurich last time, which is very much uh, um, at the origin of many of these ideas is, is a project that started in 2015 when uh, Adil Bokhari, who is on Zoom, and myself, we, we were teaching at the Stellschule in Frankfurt, which is the school that where we went to and we then worked there after that. And um, this, this work is, is really our first attempt to create like a real time modeling tool that is focusing on this idea of uh, representation or kind of image making, right? As a, as a, as a primary idea of the, the work. And I think th there are many questions that is, are raised uh, through the project, but maybe one of the ones that I was always fascinated with is this question, is there such a thing as pure design, which is constrained by the personal and not the objective condition, right? Is there such a thing? Can there be such a thing as pure design, right? Um, and this work, Platform Sandbox, is basically a series of software tools that were then kind of positioned in a series of seminars in different schools at Sergio and at SIARC, which are exploring this, this question, right? And for me, it really, this, this question starts from maybe from this diagram by Robin Evans, who's an important theorist of, of um, projection and, and this idea of uh, architectural design as a self-contained discipline that is that can stand on its own, right? That is not dependent on mathematics or it's not dependent on, on let's say, literature or something like that. A discipline that can stand on its own terms, you know. And he was he was fascinated by this question, like what is architectural imagination, and what are what are its connections to um, tools and mediums of representation? You know, what are what are its connections to then formats of presenting work, such as orthographic projection and so forth? How, how do we make sense of all of that historically speaking? And the other the other uh, the kind of uh, maybe influences is this text by Ungers called City Metaphors, which is quite an interesting uh, thought experiment, I would say, by an architect about this question of architectural knowledge as a, as a specific kind, or not knowledge, architectural thinking as a specific kind of thinking, right? Is there such a thing and, and what it might be? And he comes to this conclusion that, if anything, it, it's something close to thinking in metaphors, thinking in visual analogies, kind of very, very vague, uh, but it's not dependent on, in his idea, on, on purely ideas of geometry, let's say, coming from mathematics or ideas of, let's say, social questions or politics, right? It's kind of architecture on its own terms, basically, right? So another, another really kind of important reference for this is, uh, I don't really know if I'm going to have historical references, but I do. So, so, so another you know, reference is uh, John Haybrook and the nine square problem, which is kind of an important, historically important, um, um, it's basically an assignment for the first year, uh, students of the first year of architecture in Cooper Union, yeah, uh, in the 50s, I think, that's it's where it started, you know, uh, it's basically the idea of uh, how, understanding how do we start teaching architecture to, to kind of newcomers to the discipline. He, he was thinking about this and his answer was to kind of establish this 
nice square grid problem, right? As a as a device, as a as a way of um, kind of you know scanning through the student population, understanding what how they understand space and how they think about space itself. So, and what comes out is this kind of realization that space is something fluid, right? Then there is a gradient that this device of the grid enables. Uh, there, is a, there is a kind of a world of opportunity of space that is kind of unlocked by this un invisible device, which is very close to, to what we think. And when we think about software and we think about platforms, maybe that's how we can start to think about that. You know, that software is maybe an infrastructure that is in some ways unlocking the potential of, of the, or let's say the design potential of, of, of uh, students. Um, Obviously, um, this is this was covered before the origin of, of computer graphics in uh, projective geometry and the idea that we are still working with the same grids on grids on grids, Euclidean logic, and that uh, basically all software tools that we have they kind of operate in this space of of the kind of Cartesian certainty, right? And there is another strand of this research, right? There is another angle, which is coming from, let's say, media theory, where people like Martin Jay were talking about a visual field and, and a kind of a visual field that is enabled by uh, modernity and by, by this heritage of uh, geometry, right? And they call it the operative non-reflexive and quantitative visual field. And I think that ties into this problem of, of pure architecture and how, how does architecture produce its effects spatially, right, through graphics. So it's a kind of a system of control, and which was kind of observed by artists early in the 20th century, right? For example, like Marcel Duchamp was someone who was able to, um, to, to you know, he was able to understand basically how one might bend the fundamental rules of reality that is constructed through these systems. Uh, and this is an important work called the three, three standard stoppages, where he's kind of taking one meter and kind of dropping it on the ground. And then the new meter that arises is kind of a new measure. Yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting, it sounds like something which is um, maybe un, not, not serious in a way, but I think that's, that's exactly why it might actually work as a thought uh, experiment, as a device for kind of rethinking uh, world. Um, and other architects who worked in similar tradition like, like this is, for example, Libeskind's Micromegas project is very much about subverting the rules of perspective and kind of destroying that space, uh, not rhetorically, but literally through graphical means, right? So if, if Duchamp's project was, was partially rhetorical, it was, it was a statement. This one tries to produce it, the world of its effects literally and fully, which this is something that I think is close to this idea of the simulation. Um, it should be enough that we are, that we can make this. We don't have to, we don't have to actually say, you know, that it does that, I think. So these, these drawings are another example of, of using a different discipline to kind of map onto architecture and, uh, and kind of producing a new graphics, really, a new, a new way of thinking that is graphical, that is consistent to histories of, of representation, thinking through images and through drawing, right? So this is, I'm gonna show you a few, a few examples. This is like a default version of Platform Sandbox version three which is um, just a tool where the idea was that you have a menu of objects that are found or modeled. Um, and basically then you have all these kind of standard operations of software, like scaling, rotating, um, and placing, and you know, and then you also have kind of included uh, like physics operations, which you'll see pretty soon that you can actually uh, start working with, right? So th this would be the, the nine square idea, right? Where you kind of have a given, uh, like a toy world, which is abstract. And then you're supposed to kind of bring in your own expression into it, right? Um, 
so this is the default version. So it's it's very much something that is that I when I when I, I make it and then we give it to the students and then this becomes the base for something else. Um, you can see that. So so this one of the seminars was called "Become the Internet," right? I have different types of seminars with this tool. Um, Become the Internet was the latest one where we kind of just went online and, and uh, the, the menu was populated by objects found online, right? It didn't matter if it was architecture or something else. Uh, there are other types, you'll see that later. But Become the Internet is like, it's about this aesthetics of the simulation. How do you kind of produce a multiverse of cultural expressions from one abstract platform, right? And then the students, they kind of work with it and they, the idea is to transform the, 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 the software tool completely into, a, into your own personal thing, right? Whatever that means, uh, unique objects. And this is, it's been a few years since this is done. The first one was done, I think, in 2015, 16, 17, right? And, you know, the students get different objects and they kind of start arranging them, start playing with them within the space that is kind of constrained. Um, but what, what kind of arises from the project is this idea that there is customization, there is unique expression that you can then observe from each different person. And that becomes kind of the main driving force for the conversation that we have um, in, the, in the class. So some people are really interested in kind of realistic representations and they want to work with, with kind of specific kinds of things. Um, as you see here, for example, and then the same, the same person then starts experimenting, what if we try and have a realism together with like a cartoon? How does that work visually, right? Um, and, and, you know, each design library is made from kind of things that we find online, which we call content, yeah? So this idea of content became like really important, which means like it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's content, yeah? It's like a mashup of everything in a way. Um, so this is another student uh, that then worked with the, their own idea that you see here very much <clears throat> the, the, the format of presentation is very much this kind of playthrough video, right? Where you actually working through the software and recording it and that becomes the final work so it's it's very it's, it's about collapsing these different realities of production and then eventually if you have a lot of students they will produce a lot of different aesthetics um, and if you have even more students they produce even more aesthetics obviously right so this is this is one of the things that then ended up provoking this question like authorship what is authorship if everyone is using the same platform but they're producing kind of a unique aesthetics from it in a way, right? Um, so, so this is, these are some screenshots from, from earlier versions. In, in this version, we used architectural precedents. Uh, that was very much kind of the early days of platform was, was this idea of like, oh, let's use Hans Sharun, you know, and then the idea was like, let's kind of cut up the building in different volumetric parts. This is Adil's, uh, you know, Adil, Adil can also talk about this. It was, and, and then kind of let's use that to rearrange into new, uh, new things. Then the later uh, works were really about any kind of content, just as long as you were able to produce a consistent expression of your own idea um then that becomes the goal the goal is to produce as many images and models as possible with um, a consistent aesthetic right which then becomes something that we can actually discuss but what how, how do we um how do we speak about things which are which are a lot there is a lot of them right then see, see then in the end uh, a student might produce kind of a catalog of things and uh, this is just a small selection. We, they produce thousands of images. We have this class 
uh, when, when there is a seminar, we have this class every week, right? So the, the assignment is to produce 100 new images for each class, which sounds like a lot, but it's not because that's how the tool really works. The tool allows you to work only for five minutes, right? There is a timer and the timer goes from five minutes down and then after five minutes, it restarts. You cannot save the model. <laughs> you can just save screenshots or videos, right? So you have to work with this kind of added pressure of like a timer in the background. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think, I, I, I mean, I have so many of these examples to, to kind of share. Um, and what is interesting is, is then to see how a student might respond to, or how they might actually learn something about what they want to see in the world, you know? Um, yeah, I think maybe, maybe what I'm trying to also say is that it's possible to speak about aesthetics. Um, it is, this is not a taboo. This is not uh, something that is, is amoral, I think. I think we are, as, as, as image makers, which is what I think we are, contrary to um, Nicholas's point, I, I just want to kind of make this point. I think we are image makers and we are participating in the economy of images. And this is maybe one of the reasons why architecture is in a crisis is because we are not very good at doing this compared to other uh, disciplines such as film or games and things like that. So, so each student makes a micro genre kind of, of, of their own uh, idea. And then you can see very, very different things kind of emerging from it. These are some screenshots. Some of the students are, you know, you can see that they're very considered, very curated, very careful, interested in composition. Um, and you know, some students are interested in, in, the, in the kind of chaotic uh, idea, which is, which is cool. Um, so I'm just going to go through this. Yeah, in the end, in this seminar, we kind of produce books um, from each student gets like 100 of the best images they make. And then that becomes kind of the, 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 the final work. And so in the end, what you, what you can get is some kind of database, but this one is made by students, right? I actually tried to, to kind of train a network on this and uh, <laughs> that's a different story. But, uh, but I think what is interesting here, like there is, there is a, a massive output that then becomes, the question becomes like, how do you talk about it? How do you evaluate it? How do you uh, give some kind of comment to, to, to each image, right? When, when you have what is in the end 140 gigabytes of produced images, 30,000 images, 500 videos. And also, we, we also make apps, which are kind of, each student can make their own app, which is kind of a standalone app, right? So they can use it later on. Um, so, and then this screenshot, which I made, <laughs> is part of this kind of collection at FRAC in, in Orleans. Uh, and what is interesting here is like, from all these images, this is the one that is in the collection of something. That tells you how unprepared architectural discipline and, and everything that we kind of, data, you know, museums, galleries, collections that we participate in, they're, they're not ready to answer these questions that we have to, to pose to them in terms of um, this kind of work. Yeah. So, so then this project is kind of, um, a basis for many other projects, right? It's as, as, as um, it grew through the years, it became kind of the basis of other things, um, other small apps that then find their way into different classes and different kinds of conversations about like authorship, about aesthetics, about simulations. Um, and 
I just have a lot of these things here. Screenshots. Yeah, and then this, this is also part of this, uh, the, kind of the similar idea using a simulation as a, for, for kind of establishing this idea of a small um, kind of a diorama world, right? That then becomes populated by simulated agents and, and different kinds of objects. Um, so this is very, very similar. It's an exploration of a personal uh, design uh, kind of a preference and agenda uh, from different students. So you'll see many, many things like this. This is now becoming kind of normalized in the last few years, but you know, when we did this stuff, <laughs> everyone was like, what is that? Um, <laughs> now you can see a lot of these things online. So, oh yeah, this is actually, some, we were talking just before about uh, teaching first year students. And this is a version of this app that I make from, I, I actually teach uh, and coordinate first studio in the BRC at, at Sire. And this is the app that we use to kind of um, produce the final work, you know. It's a, it's a modeling tool and it's then you can also switch the camera and go into like a first person exploration mode, right? So it's, it's kind of a, continuous simulation setup where you're modeling at the same time you're exploring space and then you can always go in and out uh, from design space and then you can also paint we have like painting tools and um, producing that kind of stuff so this yeah and this is this is a coming from the same family of, of works, but it's been, this was used at SciArc's uh, virtual spring show, which happens, spring show at SciArc ha happens every year, right? It's like a big moment in, in school where people come together and there is an exhibition of student work and all of that. But in 2020, you know, it was a COVID year, we couldn't do it in a real building. So we made this kind of virtual um, uh, kind of exhibition and this one, this is the, the uh, work we made for this is called Twitch Plays Architecture, right? It's kind of a modeling platform activated on Twitch. So you would go on Twitch and you can then input commands, right? And then what is produced is this like central kind of thing, basically, right? And, you know, commands on the, on the left side, uh, like you can put in any of there are not so many of commands, but like it's what is interesting is it's basically a community produced work, right? And and all the pieces come from student projects, and um, the the work is this kind of building structure, whatever it is in the center, is produced in real time through Twitch interface by many people, right? And then the section comes when you type when someone types a section. Um, but here, the first time that I had this problem was like, what can I do with the camera here? You know, because the camera is the sign of authorship. Who controls the camera controls the authorship of, of a simulation. So in this case, I was, I, I wrote like a, a um, automated camera that follows the activity uh, that happens right now in space. So it's not tied to a particular person or a particular interest, but it's, it's more like uh, coming from the, the, the view from the outside, right? It's not, it's, not a, it's not a personal thing anymore. So yeah, I would not, here you can see some of the Twitch stuff that happened. Yes, there were some uh, people and animals there. Um, yeah. Great. So, and then I'm just, I'm going to show you also a few projects that I'm working on in my studio, my office. Uh, it's, one, one of them is called New Campo Marzio, and this is collaboration with Casey Ram and Laurie Michelin. Uh, this is the work that is, is basically 
the idea was to kind of connect the worlds of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning actually and, and simulation. Like how do you bring these together in, in a new um, maybe format, right? And this was exhibited at Ars Electronica. Uh, many of these projects that you'll see, they're kind of for exhibitions or for different kinds of things that are outside of like school, right? So Campo Marzio is this very famous drawing <laughs> from Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Uh, it's kind of a very important architectural document and it was subject of many studies, research projects, design kind of reimaginings historically. And uh, it's basically a representation of kind of fictional Rome, but it's also something like a re recording of Rome that might have existed Right, so there is like a part fictional moment there that no one is really sure if this is if this was a real condition or it's it's like a it's like a fiction. But, you know, there is something really interesting about this drawing actually. Um, so you know, it's kind of a unclear ontologically what it is, and that makes it particularly potent for architects, uh, especially when you look at a drawing, which is which is kind of a the main thing that we are always obsessing about. So it really became kind of an oracle, uh, graphical oracle for, for many, many different people from Eisenman to, you know, Eisenman had a project in, in the Venice Biennale 2014 based on this. And then Jeffrey Kipnis was, was doing another piece. And, you know, it's like there, there is a history of these works inspired by Piranesi. So we, we, we asked the question, like, can we make a new Campo Marzio, um, which meant basically training a, a neural network to learn features of the drawing and then kind of being able to produce a new uh, city from it. So, so you can see here, this is the, one of the generations from, from this. And what, what is interesting obviously with, with these kind of work is that it's very difficult to do a three dimensional representation from, from that kind of city. But uh, what we did is we kind of uh, you know, work with point clouds, and, and that was the main way to kind of transpose what was generated uh, in in the network to to kind of a three D space of the simulation. So, so it's it's sampled, and you know, you have new readings from it. But things that we were looking for are these threshold conditions, uh, different ways that architecture space is being kind of negotiated from inside to outside. Um, and yeah, different resolutions of this as well. So, so then, you know, the work is really a automatic simulation, which you can see on this small screen here. Don't look at that. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, it's basically a, uh, we developed a series of these of these kind of agents that can traverse the space of the point cloud, but the point cloud is being generated over and over again from the training, right? So it's, it's kind of trying to, to connect the the, the real-time generation with um, some kind of agent-based traversal that depends on, on uh, the space itself, right? So, so the, the symbolic intelligent agents, they, they translate these probabilities into final point clouds and navigation paths. One of the main things is here is like, how do you generate navigation paths in space, which is being generated uh, in real time, right? Which, which is kind of a, a technical challenge that has to be solved in a way. So, so there is a dynamic relationship between two kinds of AIs here. The, the kind of neural network generated city, which is made uh, in by learning the features of Campomazio. And on the one hand, and on the other hand, we have a set of symbolic agents which use behavior trees to kind of adapt to that new situation. Um, and on the third level, you have the interest in basically producing a visual experience, right? So again, here the camera is also automated, which means that no one is really controlling it. It's kind of controlling itself. It's um, it's it's kind of this idea that we can we can produce a, a new picture uh, for 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 this kind of work. 
Um, and, you know, these agents were made specifically to kind of to be as expressive as possible, to be able to kind of you know, com like to be able to communicate uh, and, and express what how they're uh, you know traversing the the, the space. So this was inspired by, equally by John Haydock and by Ghost in a Shell, <laughs> basically. But yeah. Cool. So then another project is, is called Dream Estate. And this one is kind of based on this experiment from 1944 called Ex experimental study in apparent behavior um, which is an interesting story it tells you that under certain conditions even 2d shapes can be interpreted as animate social agents you know uh, rather than simple intentionless dumb objects right so i'm interested in this problem of like how do you know that ai is intelligent for example Right, like, how do you know it's not pretending to be intelligent? Right, which I think is an interesting, huh? <clears throat> or, or let's say animation has this history of, like, Disney's twelve rules of animation. Is is the idea is to produce the, the illusion of life, right? Which then might might give you an, an impression that something is alive. It's not intelligent, but it is alive, right? Um, so that was, that was one of the things that we, we kind of discussed, like how do you produce a series of avatars that might kind of have embedded um, kind of sign language, right? That can project meaning to the outside when they encounter other, other agents in the world. Um, so it's a, it's a self-driven simulation populated with procedurally generated avatars and they're they're kind of communicating and, and constructing a story together when when they're um, when they meet each other, which is which is rare, but it happens, you know. So um, the modeling was based on kind of a very simplistic idea of emotions and different kinds of communications between these uh, responses. And then it was kind of um, broken down in, through, through, through this behavior tree uh, environment query system and uh, imbued with kind of different stories that they can have while they're in space. Um, and then the behavioral model is basically, you know, have you have basically kind of a trigger stimulus and then response and then you get kind of an expression which then gets really com more complex once they once they come together and meet um, so you see some other images from there they were made to kind of communicate uh, and, and be, be as expressive as possible through these lights and signage and things like this Okay. So this one I showed you before, so I'm not going to do this. And I'm going to end actually with one project that I'm still working on uh, now, which is called Planet Garden. And it's, um, it's the idea to take the simulation format and think about like planetary issues and uh, ways of maybe rethinking environmental challenges and, and how we understand models uh, in this way. So it's, it's based on um, there is a book by, by Edward O. Wilson called Hufford, which is kind of the idea to, you know, kind of leave half of the planet for rewilding and, you know, and then the rest of the, of the population can live in like a big continuous city. It's very speculative. It's a very speculative idea. So, and this is this is the book you can check it out. It's pretty interesting as a as a kind of a thought experiment on, on different ways of thinking about the environment and the planet and all of these things. So one major influence on this work is a game from 
1989 <laughs> called Sim Earth. So you guys might know Sim City, uh, but I'm pretty sure almost no one knows Sim Earth. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's great. I mean, Sim Earth is incredible. I don't know if you if you. Uh, and, uh, it's it's very it's you know rudimentary graphics, um, but what is amazing about this game is the way that they're thinking about modeling a whole planet, you know, through different systems that are kind of interlocked, and they're operational. You, you can interact with them. You can you can you know do something, and then you get an effect eventually from uh, from it. It's quite amazing. I mean, so the game is made by Will Wright, who is an original designer of SimCity and The Sims, but is co-authored by James Lovelock, right? So imagine a game made by Will Wright and co-authored by James Lovelock, who is a, uh, he invented the Gaia theory, you might have heard about it. It's like this idea that life is not something external to the planet, but it's it's, actually crucial to kind of maintaining the, the ho holistic system of the planet, right? It's quite an amazing thing. So they, they made this game um, and, you know, it's, it's like a fully realized model, very abstract, obviously, but still quite, quite interesting because, you know, the way that Will Wright talks about it is that it's, it's basically a toy, right? It's a toy. It's, it's a simulation, it's a toy, it's something that is not really a game because it doesn't, you cannot win Sim Earth. You know, you can only play it, set the conditions, and then eventually you see what, you, what comes out of it in a way. Um, so this is how it looks like. It's like 1.2 megabytes of high density data. And you, <laughs> you get a full Earth model there, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and, you know, this, is, this was the time when games, you couldn't go on Steam and download something. You had to go in a store and buy a box. So the game came with this 220-page manual, <laughs> thick manual, yeah, which tells you everything, like how to play the game. Um, what is Gaia? You know, it has like an introduction by James Lovelock right there. Um, how, what are simulations? And then it has this 100 pages at the end of like introduction to earth science, you know, talking about geology, you know, it's amazing. I mean, this is how games should be actually. This is what I'm, this is what I want games to be. This kind of multi scalar educational things that you can learn from, not only that you can, you know, it's cool if you can play, but like blow things up as well. I'm not saying, but. Uh, actually the, the copyright protection for these games are built into the manual. It would say, look up, page, whatever, this word. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah. totally. So I was interested, you know, for this part, I would just say, this is my main case study. So how is this made? This is what I was interested in. How do you make something like this? Um, and at the end, at the very end of this manual, there is, there is this image here, yeah? Which is basically a model that they used, right? Which is... Um, and then I discovered that Will Wright is someone who is kind of credited at taking models of system dynamics, which is a discipline in the 50s and 60s that's based on cybernetics and kind of taking these models and bringing them into video games and making them operational, making them as, as kind of parts of the whole idea of, of world making, right? So this is the model of, of the whole planet. And then there's a fantastic history behind these kinds of models, which start from, from this person called Jay Forrester, um, who was an American computer engineer and system scientist, and he's a founding father of system dynamics. So he was, he, he was someone who made this model, which is called World 2. Um, and this model is basically the basis of uh, all predictions that we had in the 60s about the collapse of civilization by mid 21st century, you know, the, the limits to growth, let's say it's one of famous, famous prediction. Uh, this is based on this work and, and based on this model in particular. 
So, so first they started uh, from modeling corporate supply chains and then went into modeling cities. And he, was, he, he thought that the approach of system dynamics can be applied to almost anything, right? Um, and that's what Will Wright used to make these games. So then we started working in the same way, right? Thinking about the, plant, the kind of the planetary city as this big system dynamic based model. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of research that I'm not showing, but, but what eventually came out of it is, is uh, a seminar that I did at SciArc where we explored the applications of this kind of models for, for kind of producing a game. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna show you this game uh, just now. And we, that's where I'm gonna end the presentation as well. So this is the energy and plant cycle uh, for this game. Do I have this right? Where is the? Oh yeah. So exactly. So this is this is, and you can see now the game here. Um, it's called Planet Garden, and um, the game is really kind of a reverse city builder, right? We we wanted to start from like a desert situation, and the idea is to kind of terraform this world and produce enough oxygen so that plants can grow, and you know, when you have this like equilibrium of systems and you can understand them, right? So one of the ideas behind this is to kind of recapture the power of modeling um, complex phenomena through the use of simulations. Uh, you know, what is fascinating also about th this kind of games is if you see something like civilization or a modern simulation game, they are able to present, right? They're able to present like immense amounts of data legibly which is something that you know, is difficult to do. That's why maybe one of the reasons why it's difficult to talk about climate change and like the Anthropocene and this kind of condition is because we don't have the tools, especially in architectural world to kind of work with this stuff. You know? So one of the main ideas with this was like, how, do, how can we use this techniques that were proven in games and kind of adopt them for architectural design to make a to make a legible image of something that you can clearly see its outcomes, right? It's kind of environmental outcomes. It's um, what, what it does eventually, right? So yeah, this is the, this is a very small model, but it's, it's modeling this uh, relationship between energy, water, oxygen in, in, this, in this way that is balanced. It's, uh, it's basically using um, this, uh, this approach of system dynamics to do that. So this is like the late stage uh, garden. I told you there be a lot of green stuff. Cool. So some screenshots. So this is a work in progress. It will be exhibited in 2024. And the idea by then is to produce like a big model of the planet, actually, not like a small garden only. So we are, it's gonna be great. Uh, once it's done, environmental simulation, that's, that's the, the idea. Okay, great. So this, you can see, I'm just gonna show you two of my websites. One is lifearms.io, that's my office. And the other one is worldmaking.xyz, which is basically a research website that I'm working on that looks like, no, that's not. Mm -hmm show you that <laughs> might be interesting are you seeing something or ah, right. i have magic tools no worries. <laughs> so this is kind of where i'm trying to like collect all these uh, topics and kind of work with the concepts that are interesting for I mean, not interesting, but the center to run 
what I'm talking about. And for example, you know, this question of the simulation that I was trying to explain before, you can maybe see this here. Um, you know, it's connected to, to different texts that I kind of wrote about this. And then uh, everything's kind of, in this website, everything's kind of connected to each other. So you have concepts connecting to, um, you know, texts and projects and plant garden is also here as one of the, as one of the projects. So I can't find my mouse anymore, but that's here. Garden. And then if you want to know more, right, it's all about also connecting these different references as well. Um, so talking, talking about the simulation, for example, one of the things that I was so interested in was how is, why is simulation a, a different format uh, than, than something like a fiction, which, you know, design fictions, they are established formats in architectural design, making, making a film. Right, it's kind of accepted as as architectural production, right? But there is a text that I found which is fantastic, which talks about the, the idea that simulation is somewhere between. There is a quote here that I'm going to read: "Simulations are somewhere between reality and fiction. They are not obliged to represent reality, but they have an empirical logic of their own, and therefore should not be called fictions." So. I feel like that's important for, for that. Cool, thank you.